In this video, we're checking out the Dimitu 3020 Pro Max, and we're gonna see if this is a worthwhile upgrade over the really popular 3018 machine, or a great beginner option if you're looking to get into CNC routing. What is up everybody? My name is Brandon. Welcome back to the shop. We've been doing a lot of lasers recently, but now we are moving towards CNC routers, specifically these more compact style machines. These got really popular over the past few years, specifically with the 3018. Now this 3018 machines have become very, very popular and you can get them from a bunch of different manufacturers, but they're pretty much the same thing. So this 3020 is the upgraded version of that. Now, full disclosure, right off the bat, Saint Smart did send me this machine for review, but there's no payment and they are not seeing this review before it goes out. So this is the best that I can give you of my honest opinion of this machine. Now, if you are coming from a 3018 machine, probably the biggest difference you see right off the bat is this whole thing is made out of aluminum. But the really nice thing about this is that the Z-axis assembly is aluminum versus other ones where they will be plastic or even 3D printed. And typically this is where a CNC router is gonna fail first, meaning this is where you're gonna get the most play in the entire machine. So it's really nice to see they have stepped this up and for the most part, this is constructed from V-slot aluminum rails, and the assembly of this thing does not take long at all. The majority of it is already assembled pretty much once you pull it out of the box. So let's talk about movement. One of the features that I noticed right off the bat that I haven't seen really on any other machine are these knobs right here. And you can twist them and they are going to raise and lower the different axes. Uh, same here as well. And then on the other side, we'll move it uh, left and right. What's nice about this is since these are threaded rods, um, they're actually pretty hard to move by just like pushing the axis down versus something like a Shapeoko or an X-Carve that have belts. And so you can move that pretty easy, but you have to get in here and pretty much rotate this to be able to get this to move along the axis. But having these knobs is super handy just to be able to move this around. So on the Z axis, the movement is coming through an eight millimeter lead screw, and these are 10 millimeter linear rods. And then on the Y axis, if I push this all the way out, this is also running on an eight millimeter lead screw with 12 millimeter linear rods on either side. And then coming to the X axis, it is on eight millimeter screws, but these are actually 15 millimeter linear rails. And that's something different over the 3018. And um, these are more precise, gonna give you more control and you've got guide blocks that are attaching this entire assembly to this back rail. So those rails are going to give this more rigidity because you have a better connection to the actual X axis from the Z axis assembly. And then just in terms of the actual movement, they're all running from stepper motors. I think these are NEMA 17s, which are pretty much standard across all the other machines. But another big step up over the 3018 is the actual spindle. This is an air-cooled VFD, meaning that your software is gonna be able to control the RPMs on the actual spindle. Now this one is 300 watts versus the 60 watt version that you're gonna get on the cheaper machines. So that's gonna give you more power, but you're also gonna get a max speed of 12,000 RPMs versus I think around nine or 10,000. This comes with an ER11 collet, and the one stock out of the box is gonna let you use eighth inch bits. And those are the bits they actually provide you. You're gonna get a bunch of V-carve bits, which are in the plastic inside of there. They also provide a couple other custom bits that you can use for 3D carving or special use cases. But what I found is pretty quickly, I just bought a quarter inch version of the ER11 collet. I think it's like 15 or 20 bucks. So I can use my quarter inch bits, which I have on my larger CNC machines and they have done a really good job. And I've been able to push this and really see where are the limits to this machine. Now this bigger spindle means that you need more power. And this brings me to my first con of this machine is that this is the power supply, which is 48 volts, which is a step up of what you've had before. But it would've been really nice if you could have attached this to the actual machine itself. And flipping it around to the back, it would've been nice if this power supply could have been mounted. I'm sure there's something that you could make that would just retrofit this. But this having this on the ground next to it is a little bit annoying and not quite as clean. Now this brings us to the work bed and the total work area is 300 by 200 by 72 millimeters and they have this nice grid that is either laser engraved or printed directly on top of it. Now this is metal, so one thing you have to be careful of is if you are cutting through your material, like cutting out plywood parts or MDF, 
you're gonna have to make sure that you're not touching the work bed. And the easiest way to do that is to actually put a dummy piece underneath it or a waste board that then you clamp your material on top of. And when you do that, you're gonna lose some of your Z height. Again, they do give you 72 millimeters, but you can see that goes away pretty fast, especially if you have a quarter inch bit, those typically will come out a little bit further. And then if you're putting in like a three quarter, or even an inch of material, you're not gonna have a ton of room between the uh, bit and the work area. So when you're looking at this, just know you're not gonna be working with massive pieces of material. This is for more small parts, small engravings and carves that you're gonna be doing. Now in terms of work holding, they come with M16 threaded holes and it provides you this basically like bolt wing nut screw setup that allows you to drop your material in and then clamp it down. And these are fine and it totally works, but you might wanna look at some third party hold down solutions that are a little bit faster, especially work beds that have T-slots down the middle, allow you to quickly clamp something down and then pop it off. But having these threaded inserts does give you a lot of options and you're still able to get your material clamped down so you can still carve it. You'll have all your standard connections, including limit switches. Pretty much just cut the power to the machine once you trigger one of these switches because the machine is getting too far to the end. So it will trigger it and then it'll cut power to the machine. But you have one in the X, you have one down here in the Y and then you have one for the Z and they give you the extra ability to have a Z at the very bottom as well. But for the most part, you're really not gonna use that because that is if you're gonna bottom out the spindle without a bit in it. Anytime you put a bit in it, it's gonna hit well before it's gonna actually hit that limit switch. So I just put that on there just so you can see how it's gonna work. Uh, but normally I would just have that off, especially with how the cables are hanging. So let's talk about the brains of this entire machine, this motherboard that is chilling in the back. It's pretty standard over most of these Arduino style CNC's. You're gonna have connections for your spindle. There's also connections for a laser and an additional stepper motor. And then it also has connections for your emergency stop, which is right here. Anytime you want to stop the machine because something is about to crash, because eventually it will, you just hit this button, stops it, and then you just twist it pops it back out and the power turns back on. Now you also have additional connections for a Z probe. So this would just go underneath the bit and you would connect it right there. And then depending on whatever controller software that you're using, this would drop it down, touch the Z probe, and then it knows the exact distance above your material. And then one other accessory this motherboard allows for is a offline controller for your unit. And this thing's pretty nice because it gives you ability to jog the machine when it's turned on. So you don't wanna use these knobs once you have this thing turned on because you always want it to know its position. But then also, this has an SD slot and you can actually run G code directly from your controller. So you can generate your G code in software like Easel or even Fusion 360, drop it on an SD card, come out here and run it directly from the machine. And I mean, this thing is like, we got leaf blowers out there. This thing is pretty bootleg, but it does the job for what it needs to do. And then speaking of software, they give you downloads for Candle, which is free and you can use it, it works fine. At the time of this recording, they're also giving you two months free of Carveco, Veco, I don't know how you say it. It's Windows only, so I don't use it, but it's another piece of software that will allow you to generate your G code and then send it to the machine. But I actually use Inventable's easel to control all of my machines. And again, full disclosure, I actually work for Inventable, so you might've seen me on their YouTube channel. But even before I started working for Inventables, I've always used easel just because it's easy to use. And they're adding features all the time. And so there is a USB connection on the board that goes directly to your computer. With Easel, you can use it on Mac, PC, whatever. You just have to be online when you actually generate your G code. Recently, uh, Easel did add some third party support, including this one. So I could just select it from the menu. It already had the right work area, everything I needed to go, and I was able to start using it. So let's talk about performance. I didn't do a lot of final product cars. If you just search for 3018, you're gonna see a lot of different things that you can make. What I really wanted to do is kind of test how hard you could push this machine. So you get a benchmark of what you can actually do. So I started out with some hard maple with an eighth inch bit, and it did a reasonable job. I was in the 40 to 50 inches per minute. It's a pretty shallow depth of cut, but I was getting good results. And with V-carving to do things like letters, this also performs 
great. And honestly, not that much slower than a larger X-Carve or even a larger Shape Boko. Again, the work area is way, way smaller with this machine versus those. But then I wanted to drop in a quarter inch bit and push this a little bit more to see what we could do. So I started with a quarter inch two flute upcut bit and I ran this at an eighth inch depth of cut and a 40% step over. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's totally fine. You can see what it actually looks like while it's running. And you can kind of notice that we're getting chattering. So you can hear the carve isn't totally smooth. And the finished product was pretty good, but the walls were a little bit jagged from when this would kind of skip as it was going around. So instead of what I did is I took a less aggressive depth of cut. I dropped that in half to a 16th of an inch on a quarter inch bit, and this ran fine. I ran the 60 to 80 inches per minute, which was great for this size machine. And I was actually pretty impressed by the performance as well as the final results that you could get out of a machine like this. Now again, this was with hardwood, so you get even better results if you were using soft pine or MDF or even plywood. So if you're working with softer materials like that, you're gonna be good to go. Plastics, this is gonna do a great job. Now to push this, I wanted to see what it would do with aluminum. In some of their marketing pictures, you can see them doing stuff with brass as well as with aluminum. So I threw a piece of aluminum on there and a bunch of different tests and it can carve but to get a nice result, you're gonna have to run it at a really, really shallow depth of cut so that you can keep your feed rate high enough that you're still gonna get the right chip removal for the bit, basically meaning that the aluminum isn't gonna heat up and gunk up the bit and then cause it to skip. And then if you actually go too deep, you can see I was getting a good bit of chattering where basically it would like catch on the aluminum and that the whole machine would flex a little bit before it started cutting again. And that's because even though the Z-axis is more substantial, you can see right now with my hand, I'm able to flex the Z-axis relative to the gantry. And just overall, you just don't have enough mass with this machine to really be able to do proper aluminum engraving. But if you're willing to go shallow enough and just know it's going to take a good amount of time, you could do aluminum. And even though I don't have brass here, I'm pretty confident that it's going to do a pretty good job with brass because that's going to be even softer. So now let's talk about price. This is right under 550 bucks versus a 3018, which you can find from like 300 to 350 or even cheaper depending on what you're looking at. But I'm looking at the two machines directly on SaneSmart. So I pretty much can compare apples to apples from the same manufacturer. So really the question you need to ask yourself is what am I gonna get with that extra 300 bucks? On the feature side of things, you're gonna get the offline controller, which is nice, as well as the Z probe that comes with it. You're gonna get a couple of additional bits that you don't get with just the straight 3018. Again, none of those are gonna be these quarter inch bits. They're gonna be the eighth inch. So I definitely recommend getting a little bit thicker collet and thicker bits. But the 3020 is gonna come with a bigger work area. It's only 20 millimeters bigger in the X and the Y, but you're going from 45 millimeters in the Z axis on the 3018 all the way up to 72 millimeters on the 3020. And that extra distance is really nice because even at 72, you can see this gets pretty cramped when you're using material that's even just three quarters of an inch. And then the other big difference has to do with this entire Z axis. First off, you're gonna get a stronger spindle, which is also gonna mean you're gonna get a bigger power supply. And then the entire Z axis isn't gonna be like the hard plastic or even 3D printed, but it's going to be solid aluminum for the entire assembly. And last but not least, you're gonna get linear rails on your X axis. So all of that means is you're gonna get way better reliability out of this machine when you're taking into account some of the limitations that you have with it. I was actually really impressed what you could do with quarter inch bits. Even though you had to run them at more conservative settings, you could still get a nice result and it wouldn't take you forever. So if your projects are small and this work area makes sense for you and you're looking for something stronger and stiffer than a 3018, this could be a really good option for you. Now we've been talking about the 3018 a bunch and actually reviewed a version of that from tour and we're gonna jump to that video right now and until next time go make or break something in your shop see you guys